Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a couple of uh, technical points uh, before we start our event uh, today, which I will uh, moderate with the kind, of, kind of assistance of uh, my Austrian colleagues. Um, uh, you, you, you have the platform, of course, you are accustomed to this platform due to many webinars which we had uh, recently uh, and which we uh, could uh, provide you. Um, you should put your microphone on mute uh, and uh, you can use uh, at the right uh, half of the screen uh, the chat, uh, sorry, the question and answer uh, um, uh, panel uh, to put questions to speakers and uh, I will try to uh, address them uh, and distribute them uh, between our uh, honorable speakers uh, through the event. And we, we will try to answer them uh, during the conversation or at the end of uh, uh, our topics. Um, and uh, let me uh, introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, first of all, I have to say that uh, it took us a while to uh, organize this event. Uh, it was supposed to be part of the uh, Russian Arbitration Week, but uh, due to various uh, circumstances, it was postponed. And currently, we are back on track. Uh, arbitration events are back on track. And I'm happy to start this uh, arbitration event season, uh, uh, which is going to be uh, succeeded by a couple of uh, interesting events. I'm happy to start it uh, from uh, the event uh, which we run together with our Austrian colleagues. Uh, it's an honor because, um, uh, of first of all, long-term, warm and very friendly relationships between Austria and Russia, uh, the history of which goes back to centuries. Uh, and it's a big um, uh, uh, honor because VIAC was among the first uh, international and foreign institutions to register in Russia, uh, to come here after the arbitration reform and uh, take a challenge of uh, providing services uh, to Russian clients here in Russia, which is very important for uh, Russian customers. And uh, I hope Alice will address that. Um, among the speakers, uh, we have uh, Alice Fremont wolf uh, Secretary General of VIAC Austria. Uh, which many of you know, and uh, uh, Alice is a frequent uh, traveler, uh, always welcomed in Russia. Um, uh, Steph Stefan Kroll, uh, professor, uh, international arbitrator, and co-director of uh, William V's Arbitration Mood, Vienna. Uh, Elona Tsekele, who is partner in EPOM and head of our European desk, um, and uh, a key contact for uh, continental European projects uh, and client matters. Uh, Stefan Riegel, uh, partner and head of dispute resolution team at Wolf Ties, and uh, Jonathan Barnett, who joined us at the uh, last moment but welcomed in the panel, uh, head of Austria uh, and uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, Nivellion. Um, third, third party funder institute you may note that one of the topics today which we will address in due course is about third party funding very interesting very challenging topic and uh, uh, I'm happy to have in the panel um, a person who will provide the view from the industry not only um, pure legal views so Alice I'm passing the floor to you uh, please um, tell us about um, VIAC's uh, plans uh, in Russia Thank you very much, um, Evgeny, for the very nice words of welcome. A very warm welcome from from Vienna to to Russia to Moscow. It's it's a real pity that we can't be all together and sit here in person. I remember that for the Russian Arbitration Week we had organized some special Austrian coffee and pastries to be served, but we will do this. Um, so don't worry. Now we all have our own coffee. Um, 
but at least uh, that's the way it is. Um, yes, you're, you're totally right. The ties between Austria and Russia are long and uh, are strong. And that was actually also the, the reasons why we are, um, decided to apply for the license, because we really wanted to offer um, Russian parties uh, an opportunity, an alternative um, and a foreign institution that they can rely on where they can... Uh, put their cases to. So in a nutshell, um, very quickly uh, on, on VIAG, for those who don't know, VIAG is part of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber, but um, in the sense is independent um, that really no one can interfere in our cases. We have a separate system where all the cases are being stored and there is no influence whatsoever from the chamber um, on the institution. We have administered uh, cases since 2000, uh, since 1975, around um, 70, 50 to 70, 80 cases per year with a very steady caseload. And we are a small sort of regional institution that is really focusing on the CEE, SEE region and the CIS countries. Maybe some statistics that might be of interest to you. Um, we had uh, in 2019, we had uh, four Russian parties out of 79. Um, and parties from the CEE, SEE and CIS region were uh, 26. So it's almost a third uh, of the parties. Arbitrators in, in 2019, 19, we had only one Russian arbitrator that has to change um, in the future when hopefully more uh, cases are coming in. But uh, in generally, uh, we have um, a very good pool of Russian speaking arbitrators that we can re rely on for the cases when the language of the proceedings, for example, is Russian or if the language is English, but still documents need to be um, supplied in Russian. For this, we have a non-binding list of practitioners on our website that you can search by nationality and um, by language skills and soon enough also by areas of specialization. And just to, to name a few sort of uh, Russian-speaking arbitrators also from Austria and, and um, Germany that speak really perfectly Russian would be Susanne Heger, Marco Sucic, who you also know uh, from, uh, from events, and um, Dimitri Marenkov, um, then the Norwegian co Professor Cordero Moss, um, um, Galina Sukova, uh, Professor Belovalavek from the Czech Republic. So we have really a pool of renowned arbitrators and of course there are much more. I think there are about um, 30 people on the list um, that we that we display that speak that speak Russian. So um, when we decided to to um, go for for the for the license in Russia, we we also needed the approval of the chamber here, which was given with pleasure. And um, I was very proud that when I presented to the council in uh, May 2019, there was not one vote against VIAG to be granted the license. So um, together with HKISC, uh, we have very close ties and uh, we, we are really cooperating also in terms of the, um, of the license. So with the license, VIAG is authorized um, to, to administer certain types of Russian disputes. Um, that others cannot, especially certain corporate disputes. Um, and the parties that use VIAG as the institution, they may also benefit from court assistance from um, Russian courts when need be. Um, and also the awards that are being rendered by a licensed institution such as VIAG are not considered as others um, ad hoc, which have a completely different enforcement regime. But still... Um, there are many sort of still areas that needs to be explored. And um, this is why HKISC and VIAC decided jointly to submit a request for clarification to the Ministry of Justice and the Council in February this year, where we simply sought clarifications on some um, areas within the license, within the law that needed clarifications. And this was received quite well. Um, and the answer of these clarifications was published in June this year. 
this year, and I really think uh, this this could bring some light into especially the very difficult area of the corporate disputes. Um, what are those corporate disputes that require special um, corporate rules, which neither um, the HKISE and VIAC has. But the reason for this is um, that one of the requirements for these corporate rules to, to have is that when these kind of disputes are being submitted to the institution, this institution is um, oblig ob obligated to publish on its website um, the name of the parties and also the matter of the disputes in order to give um, all the shareholders the possibility to, to join in the arbitration. And this really does not go well with the confidentiality obligation that the institutions and also all the employees have. And unless we have found a solution how to tackle this issue, um, it is very difficult for us to, to have these corporate rules. And I will continue my talks with the with the ministry and the council to see whether there could be another solution instead of publishing it on the website, uh, maybe an obligation to simply inform all the shareholders um, in order um, to tackle that. Because definitely um, this is the biggest part of the um, of the corporate disputes that would have would be of most value if we could also administer these. As uh, the same is true for the domestic disputes. It's a requirement under the license that as a foreign institution, you need um, a branch, an establishment in the, in the Russian Federation uh, in order to be eligible um, to administer domestic disputes, which are, and that is what's again clarified by the clarifications, are any disputes that are not considered international. So whenever a dispute has an international element, being a party, the seat of arbitration, closely related matter with a with a foreign um, with a with a foreign um, entity, then it's considered international, and the rest is domestic. So again, here um, we we as a, uh, the chamber has trade commissioners in many countries of this world and of course, also in Russia, in Moscow. And we will see whether um, the Ministry of Justice and the Russian government is willing to accept um, the trade attaché's offices as a sort of establishment, but we're still in talks with, um, with the ministry. So um, f for the time being, there's a restricted area that we can administer, but at least for that, um, we, we are doing it. And we hope that um, the caseload from, from the region will raise. And I am aware that a lot of um, VIAC arbitration clauses are being instituted in the, in the agreements. And it's always, uh, I always hope for the parties, of course, that they will not need to, to use the institution because um, having a dispute is always uh, difficult for the, for the entities. But at least, if need be, we are here and we, we are stand ready to assist. And I think during uh, the difficult times now in the pandemic, COVID-19, it was really the time for institutions to stand up and really prove again what is the difference between ad hoc uh, arbitration and institutional arbitration because you really have a framework. You have people sitting there like me and my team who can assist um, arbitrators and parties in, in very difficult situations which we all faced. I mean, we all had to switch to home office. We had to see what happens with the cases, with the hearings. Um, and we really tried to cooperate with the parties and especially the arbitrators. Due to our um, electronic case management system, we really could switch to remote um, administration from one day to the, to the other. So that was not an issue. Um, and we also... Um, published on our website updates, what is the situation, how to handle, for example, filing of statement of claims and other submissions. We encourage the parties and the arbitrators to only do it for the time being by electronic means. That has um, really worked well. And we really reminded the parties and the arbitrator, arbitrators that the COVID-19 is should not be seen as a free rider for indefinite postponement or adjournment of or suspension of proceedings. Of course, there was a time period where where parties and arbitrators needed some time, but then um, we could continue and 
I think especially in international arbitration, we have all the means. Remote hearings existed before for case management conferences, um, maybe even for, for legal issues, but of course they were not used that frequently um, as they now are. And we really encourage the, the arbitrators to, to switch where possible to remote hearings. And we offered um, assistance in planning um, of, those, of those hearings. So what we also did um, when we gathered enough information and exchange with other institutions, we um, published the Vienna Protocol, um, which is a guideline basically for the arbitrators when deciding to hold the hearing remotely. Um, it's a checklist what they really have to take into account. Because we all know those who have done it and we see it with webinars, as well, it is a challenge. You have much more issues that you need to take into account than for an in-person hearing because there are much more layers. You need a technical assistant, you need testing, you need fallback um, platforms, chat functions, uh, 360 degrees cameras. So the arbitrators, when they assess whether to hold a hearing or not, um, virtually, especially if one of the parties is not in agreement, uh, they really have to make sure that fair and equal treatment of the parties um, is, uh, is given and um, that the due process is not hampered because one of the parties, for example, has a very bad internet connection or any other means. I think things can be fixed, but it needs much more um, planning than probably for an in-person hearing. Well, um, that's it from, from my side. Um, that was just the, the introduction, a bit about the VIAC, and I'm now looking forward to hearing from the other speakers uh, what they have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've seen that Yevgeny had some connection issues, um, so I step in to moderate maybe his part as well. So the second part would be Austria as a place for arbitration. Uh, the pros uh, for choosing Austria for arbitration. And I understand that Stefan Kröll uh, will give an introduction why to choose Austria. Then I think Stefan Rieger will uh, provide some information on case studies and the most recent uh, decisions we had at the courts. And I will then wrap up uh, what, um, what else um, is a reason to choose Austria as a place of arbitration. So, Stefan, please. Thank you, Lona, and thank you for the organizers having me to speak on that topic. That is one of my pet topics because I think that is one of the decisions which is often underrated. Uh, it's, in my view, the second most important decision you take as a party during an arbitration where to locate the seat. And when you see practice, you're surprised how frequently parties do not pay any attention to that. So what would you be looking for when you go for a particular seat, when you decide whether to place your uh, arbitration in a particular seat? In principle, you're looking for a legal environment which allows you fair, efficient proceedings at acceptable costs resulting in an enforceable award. And when you look at the various factors, uh, the first thing which comes to mind is the applicable law. And the applicable law at the place of arbitration is first the relevant arbitration law plus the international conventions. But it's not only the applicable law which you should look at, and that's what I will do at the applicable law, looking at the applicable law, but also the relevant actors which apply that law. The pool of arbitrators available, the pool of counsel available, as well as the courts which later on have to deal with questions which may be referred to them by the parties. But last but not least, there are also the convenience factors, accessibility, hearing facilities, and the general environment. And I think that is something my colleagues will speak about. So I will largely concentrate on the question of the applicable law if you select Austria as a place of arbitration. And the most important is normally the arbitration law as such, but what is also relevant later on if you want to enforce an award is the international environment. And for that, there's nothing which could be done better in Austria. Austria is member to the uh, contracting state to the New York Convention, which ensures that any award rendered in Austria will later on be enforced, which ensures that an arbitration agreement providing for Austria has to be recognized in all the other contracting states. 
And particularly for Russian parties or for parties coming from the region, one important other convention which exists in Austria is the European Convention, which is binding for Austrian courts and which contains at least one very interesting provision, which is often overlooked, and that is the provision dealing with pathological arbitration agreements. If you have not clearly decided which institution it is, you have a mechanism uh, in the European Convention which helps you to find the appropriate solution and avoid that the arbitration agreement in the end turns out to be non-enforceable. But now let's come to the Austrian arbitration law, which is the framework for all arbitrations in Austria and which is particularly relevant for the ad hoc arbitration, but also plays a considerable relevance for institutional arbitration, where much of the administrative work is done by the institution. When you look at the Austrian arbitration law from a Russian perspective, one of the good things is it's like the Russian law based largely on the ANSATRA model law. So you are fairly familiar with the basic provisions in the law on the one hand, and second, the, it's a kind of quality mark that you know Austria has the ANSATRA model law, which had been the gold standard for a long time in international arbitration. And Austria did also has the model law, which is revised regularly in a way that you have uh, to take into account developments uh, in the law. So when the law entered into force in 2006, uh, there was no jurisprudence. After several years of experience, Austria updated the law and made some interesting changes, uh, which I hope we would have done in Germany as well. And we see whether we will manage to do that. And there's also another element in, into that. Since it's a model law jurisdiction, you may also be able to quote uh, cases from other model law jurisdictions, which have perhaps dealt with your problem you may face, and you may take guidance from them. The model law explicitly or requires the judges to take into account decisions from other jurisdictions. What is the third advantage of that? And what is something you should also take into account? How much information is available on the arbitration law as well as the arbitration practice in other languages? And since the primary language of international arbitration is English, what is available in English? And again, Austria meets the standard there. You have a number of very good commentaries in English on the Austrian arbitration law. Um, you have the newest developments uh, are regularly reported in uh, publications such as the yearbook published here annually or also by some of the leading law firms in Austria on the internet in English. And you have via the VIAC, uh, VIAC webpage, you have easy access to the most relevant information. The only thing which is lacking there would be having the commentary directly on the VIAC um, webpage where you could, as an Austrian, uh, as a non-Austrian arbitration practitioner, have a look how it has been interpreted in Austria. So now let's go to the more detailed provisions in the law and see what are you looking for as a foreign practitioner when you select a place of arbitration. You first look at the requirements for the conclusion and validity of the arbitration agreement. You look for provisions which guarantee effective proceedings if one of the parties is not participating. You then also look uh, to provisions which guarantee fair proceedings. And that is closely connected, both of them, which how they have been applied by the courts. And you look also for the provisions dealing with court intervention to ensure that there are not, is not too much court intervention on the one hand, but at the other side, there is sufficient court intervention to help you to conduct the arbitrations properly. And last but not least, you look at the setting aside proceedings provisions to ensure that once an award has been rendered, um, it is standing and can be enforced in other jurisdictions on the one hand. On the other hand, that you have a chance if something went wrong to have that properly controlled. So when I go through this list and look at the Austrian arbitration law, as well as the Austrian arbitration practice, 
Let's start with the arbitration agreement, the conclusion, validity, and enforcement of the arbitration agreement. Uh, Stephen, may, I, may, I just, sorry, may I just interrupt you? I have just one question, which uh, actually um, uh, bruises through my mind. Uh, what is, how would you think of accessibility of uh, Austrian arbitration law, Austrian arbitration practice to foreign users? For instance, uh, can you say that main commentaries, uh, main statutes, court practice can be easily assessed by Russian uh, users if they wish to select VIAC um, as a place for arbitration. And what would you recommend to go through as, a, as an essential basic information search? Thank you, Evgeny, for the question. I think that is something which is very important for practitioners there. And as I said, the leading commentaries exist in English as well. And you have a list on the VIAC uh, webpage where they provide you with the most important publications on Austrian arbitration law, also in English. And um, it would be very helpful, as I said, if there would be a commentary directly available on the webpage. Now you have to go through the usual suspect webpages, the Kluber webpage, whatever, where you have the commentary listed. And one other thing which I would, as a user, but also as an academic, consider very helpful would be regularly translations of the Austrian jurisprudence into English. You will find regularly updates as a practitioner on, again, international law office, lexology, or whatever, the, the news facts which, where you have leading Austrian practitioners summarizing it. But having it as a centralized point would be very helpful. And the, w the way I know FIAC, I'm pretty sure it will not take long till they have it on their web page. Um, so that is something which I always recommend to also the, the German arbitration community, make it accessible for foreigners. I cannot tell you whether there's any material available in Russian because I don't read any Russian. Yeah? But at least from the English perspective, it's very easily available. Yeah, so, and that is concerns all elements of the um, arbitration law. There is a lot on the VIAC arbitration practice. Yeah? Um, again, I would have preferred if the commentary is directly on the web page and not via the web shop. Yeah? But uh, again, that is something. I can't, I can't well, thank, thank you. This is, this is really helpful, but I can't avoid further question. Uh, uh, you are international practitioner. You're, you sit as arbitrator in many cases. Uh, you can compare. How would you compare uh, accessibility of uh, um, Austrian arbitration law to foreign users uh, in comparing it to London, who is competitor number one, I think, for continental Europe, uh, or Sweden, for example, or uh, Paris? Yeah. Um as I said, I think the basic information is there. London has naturally the advantage that all the English court decisions are published in English. Yeah, uh, they are available and uh, they have one of the big advantages. They have a much bigger marketing uh, oh, budget thought, yeah, where, they, where they concentrate on that. Yeah, I think you can... I mean, you have space to develop and I think you, you, you get a very good idea of... Uh, Austrian court practice in relation to arbitration uh, to be published regularly, uh, which would be very, very useful and uh, very, very, very important for uh, Russian users to assess. Yeah. Can, I, can I step in? Uh, I think it has been done uh, in the Austrian arbitration yearbook that is always displayed also on the um, uh, Vienna arbitration days since 10 years. You have a summary of all the Austrian Supreme Court decisions in English, um, in that in that book, basically. So that is available. But of course, and that's an issue. Uh, what Stefan you said, it's usually when it's via publications, it's much easier to put it on the website. But I can't just you know scan a commentary of another publisher and put it on our website. Then I would probably have um, good publishing for the users, but a bad recommendation with the publisher. So that's, but for the next handbooks and stuff, we are already negotiating ebooks. So this is, yes. this is going to be the case. Well, first of all, that is, thank you for jumping in. Second, uh, thank you for giving me this uh, recent yearbook as a present during St. Petersburg Legal Forum. I, I'm, I'm regularly going through it. It's a very, very good book. Uh, very big one, really thick one, like we arbitration practitioners like it to be, like 
at least 500 pages, uh, a brick, you know. So, uh, yes, you are right. And uh, ebooks, yes, ebooks is is a future. So uh, uh, my uh, my children, they just they just hate paper books. They they just want it all to be digital. So um, yeah, that's 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 the future. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Stefan, would you would you like to say about the arbitration clause and going deeper? I, I interrupted you. Sorry, and we need to we need to move on. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, um, um, yeah. Can, can I interrupt just with one addition, please? Yeah. Five seconds. And that is, there's further case law on the Uncitrol website, uh, Clout, the case law of Uncitrol cases. Uh, so that is also translated into the, the six languages of the UN. So there's another resource that's available to the public. Yeah. That's what I mentioned thanks, before, thanks, yeah. that you can also refer to case law from other model law jurisdictions, yeah, which is not binding on Austrian courts, yeah, but at least can be referred to, yeah, because the model law contains a provision that it should be interpreted in the light of its international origin. But when you come to the arbitration agreement, again, the Austrian law meets largely the standard there. You have the written form, yeah, there are facilitations for that. And you have a very broad provision for arbitrability. Uh, it's not only uh, those disputes which the parties can uh, dispose of the rights, but Austria opted for the broadest possibility for arbitrability, saying every, every dispute which has an economic interest can be referred to arbitration. And so no, I have to I have to continue and put you one more question. Sorry, I, I, I'm interrupting you all the time, but really so many so many thoughts in my mind. Uh, yeah. What about sanctioned parties? It's a, it's a hot issue. It's not a secret, hot topic in this part of the world. Uh, yeah. is, there any Austrian, is there any Austrian court's case law in relation to sanctioned or sanction-related parties and their participation in the arbitration? What would you recommend to look for? I'm not an expert in Austrian law, and I haven't looked into that question. If you would, my guess on the what I've seen from the Austrian arbitration law, I think that disputes are clearly arbitrable. Yeah, um, so there's no problem with the arbitrability. The question may, in the end, be if the arbitrator decides one way or another, there may be an issue of public policy with the enforcement setting aside of reward. But the mere fact that there are sanctions involved that would not prevent, in my uh, view any Austrian arbitral tribunal to deal with the issue. But I'm happy to be corrected by the Austrian colleagues, which are probably much more into that. I can what? just I can just confirm oh, what you have said, Stefan. Uh, from an institutional point of view, the, the fact that the party is sanctioned has nothing to do with the arbitrability or with us uh, accepting uh, the case. Uh, the problem is when it comes to sending money, especially if, if the claimant is being sanctioned, because if we can't receive the advance on costs, if we don't find a bank and we we are in negotiation with local small Austrian banks, um, for them it might be easier to accept money, um, uh, then, then it gets difficult. And I think um, then the arbitration clause would be temporarily inoperable, which opens again uh, the pass to the state courts, because this is something we can't, I mean, we Institution. If we don't receive the advance on costs, we still ha we have no possibility of of letting the case go forward, and especially if the sanction party is a claimant um, and the respondent refuses to to pay the share, which he could, then yeah, then you're then you're blocked. So that is just a thought from my mind. If you if I may, just a thought from my mind. Number one, it's a hot topic. I confirm. Some of our clients uh, and clients of our colleagues do experience difficulties of paying uh, arbitration fees, uh, advances, if they are sanctioned. It's impossible. Uh, European institutions apply to OFAC for explanation. They don't receive any answer. So it's a hot topic, number one. Number two, as an arbitration institution registered in Russia, I think it's time for VIAC to think about opening an account in Russian bank. But it's just a thought. I mean... No, no. You're, you're totally right. Um, uh, this is not something that sort of I decide uh, as the institution, but it's a chamber decision. Certainly, and I will, I will bring certainly. forward this um, to to the chamber. And this, uh, this, this would mm -hmm. be also cheaper for Russian users because there won't be any fees, any problems with the conversion of currencies and uh, 
um, just just as 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 uh, you know, thinking loud. But we are moving forward, Stefan. Yeah. If I, if I may, uh, if I may, Alice, and I would like actually to ask my colleague uh, Ilona Sikeli, with whom we are running several very interesting projects in connection to international disputes with former CIA, um, with CIS and uh, former uh, so Soviet republics. Uh, in connection to construction, I know that Alona uh, in the past is a big construction specialist and fan of uh, construction disputes. Alona, would you recommend uh, selecting Austrian law in Austrian arbitration for high profile, uh, you know, big infrastructural disputes, which, which are many in Russia and uh, many in uh, neighboring countries? Yeah, of course, I would uh, recommend Austria as a place for arbitration, which I actually do over the last, I would say, 13 years since I left Austria, because my background is uh, I'm, you know, uh, I studied in Austria and I was admitted in Austria to the bar. Um, and since I moved to Russia, um, I'm, I'm promoting Vienna as a place of arbitration. And of course, I would recommend to do that because we have seen in the past a lot of arbitration cases run by different institutions. And due to the fact that Russia is so close to Austria, um, of course, Austria would be a place of arbitration. But not only because of that, I say as well, Austria is very arbitration friendly. Um, then the legal system is very well developed and very efficient. I understand that Stefan Riegler wanted to give more insights on Austrian law and why to choose Austrian law and the place of arbitration. But what I can say as well, what an advantage is maybe for Russians uh, to go to Austria. First of all, it's very close to Russia. There's like, if there would not be COVID uh, time currently, where there's of course no flight, but in the past you, you could reach six times uh, per day uh, Austria by plane. Um, the costs are much lower in Austria than uh, compared to London or Paris or any other place. Also, it's very cost effective and the costs are very predictable here in Russia. So we would not end up with uh, tremendous uh, amounts for bills, uh, uh, which are not predictable very often with other institutions. What I can say as well, I mean, the Russian community uh, in, in Austria is growing uh, also, uh, all the lawyers and the law firms have extensive experience with working on CE and CIS matters, not only because we very often or we very, let's say, in early years uh, established very, uh, very close relations to Russia and the other CIS countries. Um, so then the place, um, it's, I mean, it's the heart of Europe, of course. So that's another thing I can uh, say on that. And everything is, is just cheaper. So, I mean, if you want, you really have to think about costs, then I would go to Austria. But what I understand, I didn't want to interrupt because Stefan Kroll did not yet finish what he wanted to say. But I understand that Stefan Riegler wanted to give more insight on the Austrian law and why to choose Austrian law. So, I mean, I, I leave it now up to Stefan Riegler to continue and then I will wrap up in the end. Well, thank you very much, Ilona. Uh, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Stefan Riegler and uh, specifically, uh, it would be um, a good switch from what Ilona has been saying because uh, Stefan is going to uh, speak about uh, force majeure, which is undoubtedly the hottest topic uh, for the last six months, and uh, what is the position of the Austrian uh, material law, if applicable to the contract, uh, uh, in connection to this uh, hot topic? Um, thank you very much. Before, before I talk about that, let me also say thank you for having me, and also say, uh, indeed, as Elise said, I would have uh, preferred being uh, in Moscow again. But obviously, it's very nice to be here in this format. Uh, also, as a second thought up front, it's obviously very nice to hear a non-Austrian talk about Austria the way that Stefan Köln has done. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm not sure that, that you're completely done with what you said, but uh, uh, a little bit add, uh, before I come to the substantive law angle, let me uh, add uh, one or two thoughts on what has been said, because I think it's important to really understand that, um, you know, there is the logistic side and there is the cost side, uh, but there is also a certain proximity 
uh, to uh, the uh, Russia, Eastern European, uh, CIS countries. Um, and that is, I think, a certain understanding uh, that would help in resolving disputes, um, both from a substantive and then also, in particular, from a procedural uh, perspective. You know, I don't want to hijack this um, webinar to talk about the progress, but I think uh, there is a certain understanding uh, in Austria, for example, when it comes to document production, that there needs to be a certain limit. And, and finally, let me just say that um, what is very important that the legal framework that Stefan Kohl has outlined is actually enforced and supported by the case law of the Supreme Court. There is only one instance to challenge an arbitral award in Austria, and that's the Austrian Supreme Court. But there's a specific panel for this. And if you look at the recent case law in the last couple of years, um, it's a uh, environment that supports um, and upholds uh, awards. I think that's uh, important to note. Um, when we turn to the substantive law side, I mean, obviously, um, choosing VIA or choosing Austria as a seat of arbitration doesn't mean that the parties have chosen the Austrian substantive law. But assuming uh, they are, I think it's also safe to say that it's a safe and tested uh, legal environment. Um, it's a CISG uh, jurisdiction. And when it comes to the civil law, it's uh, very similar to the German uh, civil law. Um, there is a lot of uh, similar or to some extent even identical concepts. Um, it supports obviously uh, contracts, practice and so on. It's one of the principles that is uh, then, um, you know, contemplated with uh, uh, exceptions to that rule. Uh, when it comes to force measure, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how much time we want to spend on force measure uh, in light of this topic having come up maybe once or twice <laughs> in the last couple of months. But the short answer, I think, is that Austrian uh, substantive law um, does not have the one single uh, provision and definition of force majeure. Uh, it recognizes in a number of different legal concepts the thinking behind a vis major uh, event. Uh, you have a concept of initial um, legal and factual uh, impossibility. You have default provisions. You have a provision on the frustration uh, of the contract. You have recognized in case law clausula uh, rebus sixtantibus. So you have these concepts there. They are recognized. Um, I think it's fair to say that it very much, uh, I'm not, uh, I would assume I'm not the first one to say this on false majeure. It very much depends on the specific case, not just on the vis major that is invoked, but in particular on the contract that is underlying the dispute and whether the parties have foreseen uh, what qualifies as a force majeure event and how to deal with that, um, whether it's a um, permanent or not uh, issue, whether it um, justifies uh, the rescindment or termination of the contract um, and, and, and a mitigation of damages and, and all that. And I think that really needs to be looked at in a specific case. Um, what I think is important to understand uh, when it comes to Austrian substantive law, again, in a broader sense, is that Austrian case law is uh, in the public domain, more or less. There is a specific platform uh, where a Supreme Court and, lo and certain lower court decisions are uh, available. So you have really a vast um, pool of case law that is available where you can really specifically look at what the Austrian pr Supreme Court has said on a certain substantive law issue to try to foresee how another court in Austria and um, possibly a tribunal that applies Austrian substantive law would decide uh, an issue like that. Well, this is, this, is, this is very very important, sorry to interrupt you, because in Russia we have also similar platform, but uh, 
uh, it works efficiently only for commercial court cases and the courts of general jurisdiction are uh, merging with it currently. But, um, well, probably you need to know German, but we just have to learn it uh, to, to get an easy access to, to, the, to the platform which you described. But can I ask you about um, procedural force majeure, which is... Uh, um, uh, currently managed through online hearings, uh, including the hearings and arbitration. And this goes also to Alice and uh, uh, Stefan Kohl. Uh, what's your experience for the last six months uh, with online hearings, just very briefly? And is there any court practice in Austria, in Germany, which has established standards, minimum standards for online hearings to make awards enforceable and avoid uh, unnecessary challenges later. Can I can I say something from the institutional perspective? Because we oh, have be been great. we have been um, talking with it with 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 state courts as well, and I think that the state courts currently they are learning from arbitration rather than than mm -hmm. vice versa. Uh, the good news is that the courts have started using remote hearings uh, as a substitute for in-person hearings, but they, in the courts, they're still more conservative that they say they can, they, they only want to do it if both, both parties consent. And if they, both parties consent, then they simply use the Zoom platform um, um, for the reason that, you know, uh, there's no confidentiality in court cases. Everything should be public. And what could be more public than using Zoom? So, so this is the good thing. So I think the good message is that courts are familiar now more and more with um, virtual hearings. Uh, so I think a virtual hearing per se, as I explained before when I, when I was speaking, will not be um, seen against uh, procedural public policy, even though uh, one of the parties probably did not agree if the arbitral tribunal made the assessment. And I think that's that's um, why checklists such as the VIAC protocol are helpful, because it really lists all the instances. And we have been asked by the state courts in Austria whether we can also publish this in German, because they want to take guideline from that. This is, this is where I need to interrupt you and ask you, because this is very important. From my own experience as arbitrator, which I just had recently during yeah. pandemic, one party agrees to switch online. Yes. The other party says, we are on the remote, we don't have computers, we don't have programs, we are in some village in Siberia because this is the safest place. Mm -hmm. Does tribunal have discretion under the VIA rules to switch online in this situation? Oh. Well, the VIAC rules are very open. The, 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 the arbitral tribunal has any kind of discretion whatsoever. Uh, of course, I think in that regard, it has to weigh what is fair and reasonable, right to be heard, equal treatment of the parties, and so on, and so on, and so on. If the platform provides, I think they can switch it on if they provide the reasons. But I think you can't say this is possible under the rules or not. I think it's a case-by-case assessment of that particular tribunal in the particular circumstances. But, you know, a tribunal does not have coercive powers, so it cannot it cannot summon a party, but it can draw inferences. And I think it's always informing the parties, what will I do if you do not switch on? Uh, what will this mean for the proceedings? And then it has to assess whether it can go forward because it might infringe a party's right to be heard. And if I would be the other party in their shoes, I would say, well, I provide you, I send you a data cube, I will send you a computer, I will make sure that you have that particular access. So I think everything is, is possible nowadays, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, and um, uh, I, I know that one of the reasons uh, uh, why... Uh, English law is sometimes recommended and English courts are sometimes picked up uh, or English arbitration is because uh, we know that the English law can be quite robust uh, on parties unwilling to cooperate to make the arbitration clause being enforced. Uh, but what is the uh, experience of uh, our uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Stefan Kroll and uh, Stefan Riegler? Would you, would you like to comment a few minutes on this um, uh, natural difficulties when uh, parties disagree uh, to go online or not to go online. 
Perhaps I can start again looking at the legal background or legal framework. The framework allows the courts to enforce the awards later on. Yeah, And my ex or what I've seen from the Austrian jurisprudence is uh, as long as there was an opportunity to participate, that is sufficient. You have this special provision in the Austrian law that you can have the hearing without the party as long as you don't take the um, um, things to, ad to be admitted. Yeah, there's a special provision there. And I think if you have taken all the steps, which Alice has mentioned, that you have provided the other part with access, possible access, the courts would then say, okay, it's your choice whether you participate or not. Uh, it's your choice. We have a pandemic presently and we have to take that into account. So my guess from an outsider looking just at the jurisprudence I've seen, I think courts would have held proceedings done by arbitrators in the particular way uh, that the right to be heard has been protected uh, in one way or another. And I think they're fairly broad Uh, principles there, which allow you to do that. But I'm um, again, Stefan is probably much closer to that. I, I think uh, both of you, Alice and Stefan, outlined. I think what is the current status? I mean, to be fair, um, as far as I know, uh, there is no Supreme Court decision on this. So this is what I think uh, most people would expect the Supreme Court to say, and it remains to be seen whether. A party that loses in an arbitration would then challenge the award on that basis, namely that against its will, the oral hearing was conducted um, virtually. Um, I, I think it's just a new situation that we haven't been confronted with. And I think the, the, the argument is an interesting one that it's not, it doesn't have to be just a hearing, but it has to be a hearing where the party and the council can physically uh, present the case before the tribunal and um, um, uh, those questions to witnesses. That is a particular uh, question that is not new, that sometimes witnesses are, for whatever reasons, sometimes uh, for physical reasons, not in a position to travel. Um, But I think the counter-argument, uh, one of the counter-arguments, uh, regardless of the uh, legal framework that Stefan has now briefly outlined, is what is the alternative? If the alternative is that we wait for this situation to be over, and effectively meaning that every single arbitration that requires a hearing, because the parties uh, would request the hearing, um, and then it would be Uh, more or less the rule, or at least a strong indication, uh, would we want to wait uh, for all these arbitrations now um, to be suspended and we don't even know until which point in time and we postpone it for another six months and another six months and another six months? So I think, you know, I, I realize that practical uh, issues uh, might not be the best uh, argument when it comes to the right to be heard. But at the same time, you can argue that due process for a claimant to receive a decision uh, also speaks uh, in favor of, you know, continuing with the arbitration. Thank you very much. Thank you both, Stefan. And uh, to complete this section uh, and move to the next section of our discussion, which is very interesting and uh, relates to third party finance, uh, I would like to ask Alice one more question. Uh, Alice, when I'm thinking about arbitration rules, just from the top of my head, uh, they are constantly improving, uh, and uh, this pandemic situation also brought to certain improvements and further tuning. So if you compare arbitration rules to uh, cars, we would say that um, SIAC is probably Ferrari, uh, LCIA is probably um, uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, uh, old-fashioned, reliable, sometimes old-fashioned. Uh, uh, Sweden, more difficult because, uh, you know, probably, probably Volvo. Uh, how, would you, how, would you, how would you position VIAC here? And um, uh, um, how would you uh, explain to our, uh, to our listeners uh, the future of VIAC rules? Just briefly, Are you thinking about adding something in connection to online hearing, for example, and legitimizing online hearing, giving tribunal more discretion on online hearings? What's the situation now? 
Um, thanks, Evgeny. I think it's a bit unfair to do this with a car comparison because as Austrians, yeah, does, we yeah. have to offer <laughs> in terms we're of cars. Of bicycles, you know? <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say we're more like the reliable Puch bicycle, which is environmentally sustainable. No, but uh, joke aside, the good news is that our rules are already so flexible and at the same time so lean that we do not have to provide anything with remote hearings because everything is already there. This, the VIAT rules, unlike the ICC rules, only talk about oral hearings, but they don't specify if that has to be in person or remotely. So even before the pandemic, remote hearings were allowed, possible, and were being held. So that is the good news, that our rules are that robust and that um, um, you know, have been drafted with such a foresight and not going with, you know, uh, certain, um, I would say, uh, uh, topics that are that are in fashion. Uh, so, so our rules always work. So there is no real need to really put an additional wording in terms of remote hearings. But maybe what we would do is add in the handbook a section on remote hearing explaining or in the arbitrator guidelines, you know, explaining what what it is. But I don't think that we, in terms of remote hearings, we need to change anything uh, in respect to the rules. Thank you, Alice. This was very helpful uh, and uh, should be noted by our listeners, of course, uh, for you know, future consideration. And uh, uh, Ilona, would you like to comment something on the Austrian or Austrian uh, procedure before we before we move to to the topic of third party finance I think you know because looking at the the watch now I think we should move on to third party funding now um, because uh, I understand we have like 30 minutes reserved for third party funding um, so that's why I suggest, um, anyhow, Stefan and Stefan already mentioned quite a lot on Austrian law and how the procedure is going. So I would say let's continue with third party funding and then let's keep like 10 minutes maybe for uh, participants to raise some questions to the audience. Um, and uh, maybe I've seen as well some questions. Uh, yeah, there's to one the two question. Of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah which two will, of us. But, but I would say let's. Step to the program and uh, and then go back to the questions if there are any any specific uh, questions. And I think I, I said the main issue is really, I mean, why to choose Austria? I mean, really, it's first of all, very easily to reach. Secondly, uh, Austria has extensive experience with CE and CIS matters, very well experienced lawyers and attorneys and arbitrators. And what is really important uh, that VIAC is very cost effective and the costs are predictable and it's much cheaper than going to London, to Hong Kong, to Singapore or, or Paris for arbitration. So I think this is really uh, the main issues where I first to choose. And then, of course, uh, choice of law, choice of uh, what kind of arbitration rules we, we're going to apply. And uh, yeah, this is just to wrap it up why really Austria is, is, is the place of arbitration to go. But well, I would say you, let's Anna. continue with, yeah. Thank yeah, you, thank you. Let's, let's move on. Uh, and uh, thank you for reminding us that we come to arbitration specialization for opportunity to travel to beautiful places. That's true, that's true. That's what most of the junior lawyers uh, want in their lives when they come to practice arbitration in uh, law firms. Uh, and we move to the new topic, which is uh, third-party finance. Uh, we have Jonathan Barnett uh, from Navidian joining us, uh, and uh, we're going to discuss uh, various uh, issues and considerations in connection to this topic. Uh, and... Uh, Jonathan, would you would you would you like to start uh, from um, the industry perspective? Give us give us uh, some background uh, so that we could start our discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Evgeny, and uh, hello everyone. Lovely to join you. Thank you for having me as a guest. Uh, excuse my Russian, but privyet. 
My, uh, I think it would help to put this into context. I can, will and can, of course, speak about funding, but also to give some of my background and who Nivalion is, just uh, so you can understand. Our focus is purely on investment, which is balancing between risk and reward. Uh, in order to assess that, I and my colleagues here at Nivalion uh, are all former lawyers. I was in private practice for almost 20 years, focusing on international arbitration and international litigation. A lot of cases which I worked on uh, were in Russia, CIS, oil and gas, and other disputes. Um, so I do have experience both with the courts and also with arbitration in the region. Here, um, I'm sitting in Vienna, head of uh, Austria and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, from our office here in Vienna, our headquarters is in Zug in Switzerland. So we are a, <clears throat> excuse me, we're an investment uh, fund. We invest in disputes. What does that mean? How does that work? In short, we turn what is a party, let's say for the sake of it, a company's liability, if not a very significant liability, a dispute or a suite of disputes, and turn that into an asset for ourselves. We do that by assessing the risk involved, namely the prospects of success, what's the likelihood of the case uh, succeeding, and more importantly, what's the prospects of uh, being able to recover? So enforcement, and not only enforcement through the courts, but actually knowing where assets are is key to what we do and see what we look for through our due diligence is to obtain as much visibility as possible on those issues. Uh, put in a simple way, an arbitral award is often an impressive piece of writing, but unless it can be turned into money, it is not worth the paper that it's written on as uh, brutal as that sounds. So our focus is on turning an award into cash, into assets and the like, being able to seize, of course, subject to the arbitration being successful. What I can say is we focus here um, in, in Vienna on Austrian Central and Eastern Europe. We're also joined by my colleague, uh, Jakob Hubert, who sits, he's head of our Frankfurt office. Jakob is uh, in Germany, obviously, but also focuses on Russia and CIS disputes. Jakob is uh, originally from Kyrgyzstan, a native Russian speaker, and has uh, extensive knowledge and experience in the region. Why I mention Jakob is here at Nivalion, we are well positioned to understand this region together with uh, beyond Russia, CIS, and the emerging uh, funding interest and experience with funding uh, throughout this region. So I thought what I'd do is to give you a funder's perspective, uh, to give you an insight into what that actually means. Um, our focus, as I said, is on managing risk and deciding whether or not to invest in that risk. Just to give, put that in context, generally amongst the funding industry worldwide, uh, something between 7 to 10% of funding applications are approved. So if you step back and consider that, in order to uh, be approved for funding, it is an extremely high threshold of 100 applications we receive, we approve at maximum 10, if not less. So there are many different aspects as to what uh, our criteria are, how a party can satisfy those criteria. Uh, but in short, we're finding here in, uh, in Austria a, an increased interest in funding. We find that uh, parties council, both in Austria and within the region, and the region, of course, is loosely defined, but for the purposes of this discussion for Central and Eastern Europe, it would be, well, it is the usual suspects that we see in the international landscape, commercial and treaty arbitrations, Romania, Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, Hungary as well, Poland, of course. Uh, we see many applications coming from those jurisdictions um, applying for funding and uh, either which is encouraging from our perspective, seeking, um, also seeking uh, information to, in essence, be educated. So funding in this region is at a, say, different uh, stage than it is in other jurisdictions. 
for example, in England. Um, as you may be able to hear, I am Australian. I was working for an Australian funder in Australia, focusing on arbitration in Singapore and Hong Kong. Those jurisdictions, in particular Australia, where you may know funding started about 20 years ago, um, are very well developed. In this region, it is, as I said before, a learning curve. So part of our role here is to educate, is to inform the market, and to make lawyers' parties aware of this option. Um, the option that we offer which it is self-serving to say, but I think it's fair to see. It's an attractive option for parties in the very least to consider, to be aware of. Namely, you don't have to pay everything or anything to do with your dispute except uh, to pay a success fee if and when successful and, I repeat, if and when the monies are able to be recovered in exchange for a, a share in the profits. If the party is unsuccessful, we, the funder, take all the risk, we pay all the costs or whatever is agreed uh, between the parties, between us and the funded party. So what uh, we offer in that respect is to um, take the legal spend of the balance sheet. Now, just hearing you before, Ilona, speak about Austria as well, uh, Alice, and that the it is cost efficient, uh, that it's an attractive option. For us as a funder, yes, that, that does increase uh, the attractive nature of this region, hence why we, Nivalion, have uh, decided to invest in this region. Uh, we are the first funder to have a permanent presence here in Austria, our international funder focusing on international arbitration and litigation throughout the region. So we can see and we do see repeatedly um, a business model which is going from strength to strength. Um, what I would like to do, if I may please, is just to slightly change the perspective and that is with respect to Russian uh, to Russia and CIS. So speaking on behalf of Jakob, who I would also invite um, to, to ask questions and to comment on, but what we're seeing in CIS and Russia is also an increased interest in funding. Uh, one that comes to mind apart from Russia is Kazakhstan, an obvious, uh, obvious target there, oil and gas and the like, the disputes that arise from the region and the availability of funding for parties to engage in what are more often than not very high stakes and also uh, very large amounts in dispute. But the question uh, is, we see time and again when in discussions with council, council know of the usual suspects and they are seated in London. We, Nivalion, uh, are focused on continental Europe. There are also other funders in Russia in continental Europe. So there's a question really for me to the audience, to council, um, is why keep going back to London? I would suspect it's either a lack of knowledge of the availability of other funders and or simply walking the path that is already tread. Um, and to consider that there are other options. Of course, yes, Nivalion, but other options throughout continental Europe that A, are uh, civil law-based uh, funders at heart. Uh, I, being a common law lawyer, bring a different perspective to, to Nivalion, but we have mainly Swiss and German lawyers. Um, we... Uh, also consider that you know, understanding the civil law jurisdictions brings with it, say, a unique selling point for, uh, for potential clients and for, for counsel. Um, of course, more than happy to answer any further questions, although speaking of which, I see that there is a question here. Uh, would we fund... Wait, 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 wait. This is my prerogative. Is All my right. Prerogative. My apologies. <laughs> Thanks a lot. No, no, not at all. I will pass. I will pass the floor to you and other speakers to address the question if we have time at the end, because uh, the question which you are probably reading uh, is quite philosophical, and we can speak at length about it. But I would like to hear from uh, Stefan Riegler uh, the Austrian perspective of. Uh, third-party funding, uh, recent amendments to VIAC rules uh, taking into consideration this option, and uh, maybe any scandals which were connected with third-party funding heard about in Austria, because for me, third-party funding is always uh, uh, nice because it brings some sort of procedural complications. Disclosure, uh, finance of losses of the other party if uh, arbitration is lost, 
and so on. So what, what can you say? What, what, what you can share with us? Well, I think there is uh, uh, two levels uh, to discuss this. One is, um, as Jonathan has uh, mentioned, the question, how often is it, is it used? Um, in Austria, for example, we have a history of funding in litigation, but funding in arbitration is relatively new. And the you know global uh, tide of um, third-party funding I would say is might be coming, but it is not there. There might be a number of reasons because uh, we are very cost efficient or it is unknown, but uh, it is, I think, not uh, there yet. Um, the second level, of course, is the legal level. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, we do not have any court decisions on arbitration, third party funding. Uh, Obviously, there are the classical legal issues that are discussed with it. The one is the disclosure question, and the other one are a number of questions um, in the context of costs. Um, the working group of the last amendment of the Vienna Rules discussed this topic quite heavily, uh, I think. Um, in the second edition to the handbook, you will find quite an extensive chapter on this topic um, that was uh, co-written by Stavros Bekulakis and Stefan Kroll and me, uh, where, you know, there is both a discussion on third-party funding and on the current status of Austrian law and the Vienna Rules. The working group then uh, on the Vienna Rules decided not to include a specific provision on third-party funding in the in the rules, and currently there is no such explicit provision. Um, the main reasons for that was that um, actually twofold. One that, as Alice mentioned, the Vienna Rules is a very flexible set of rules, and the working group believed that um, the existing provisions on costs on disclosure actually make it possible for a tribunal to deal with third-party funding issues. Um, when it comes to disclosure, um, there is uh, a provision in the Vienna Rules, there is the IBE guidelines, which may or may not be applicable. There is a specific uh, general standard um, on, on that topic. So the working group believe that it is not necessarily uh, not necessary to implement a specific provision on third-party funding, neither on disclosure nor on costs in the Vienna rules. And the third uh, reason was that, you know, as we've seen uh, now with uh, Jonathan as well, and as I mentioned in the start, it's a topic, um, and really I'm talking about, you know, professional third-party funding in commercial arbitration that is still, or at least when the working group thought about it, was still, to some extent, a moving target. And there was a certain consensus that it might make sense to wait how that um, will evolve. I do believe, uh, but this is more for Elise to say, that um, VIAC is absolutely open to reconsider its position, not really in terms of you know, what the position on disclosure on or on costs is, but rather its position on whether it would might be beneficial to have a provision uh, in the rules specifically dealing uh, with third-party funding, and then I would presume it would be a provision dealing with disclosure and with costs. And I think that's the current status, but maybe at least you're better uh, suited to, to give uh, feedback on that. Well, Stefan, thank you. Thank you for explaining this. Before I pass the floor to the next speaker, I'm thinking about a natural competitor, which is which is uh, London. Uh, and uh, one of the questions uh, from our participants uh, just confirms that. So in London, uh, in arbitration, you have to disclose, but in the, the existence of third-party funder. But you, if you are litigating in the High Court of Justice, for instance, you don't have to disclose the identity of third-party funder. You just need to say that this is, there is a third-party funder. If you provide counter security, there is no need, which is which is quite peculiar and maybe one of the reasons why the 
um, uh, the city is so popular place for uh, flourishing of third party founder uh, enterprises uh, which was which was confirmed by Jonathan uh, and uh, well thank you for um, explaining us the position and discussions around the disclosure also I would like to uh, put into the floor for discussion uh, possibility of third party founder uh being a shadow uh, manager of the arbitration which is which is a natural problem because if you provide money if you provide finance you want to influence the key decisions so like settlement discussions for example and uh, i would like to ask uh, yes jonathan uh, just, just just one second i know but, but your industrial perspective so we, we definitely need to hear from you but what is the what is your view? I would like to ask Stefan Kroll, and I would like to ask Alice. Just two minutes, uh, if you may comment. Uh, third party funders influence on the process. What's your experience, Stefan? Okay, if you want to say, um, my experience is non-existent here yeah, uh, because I'm only acting as an arbitrator, so I don't see what happens be behind the scene. But I'm not 100% sure whether that would the London experience you mentioned will continue. We had recently this award which was set aside because there were two close connections between one of the arbitrators and the experts. And I'm not sure whether that will not in over time also be extended connections between the arbitrator and the funder. Uh, if the arbitrator is sitting regularly in cases funded by the particular funder, and then you have the funder who is influencing the selection of the arbitrator, whether that may be an issue. And that is also something which I would have mentioned uh, in Austria. You have considerable amount of uh, Supreme Court decisions on disclosure and challenges of arbitrator, yeah, which I find, think have a fairly balanced way of not every failure of disclosure justifies a challenge of an arbitrator. But on the other hand, if there are two close connections, it's justified yeah, because you threaten arbitration by not being considered anymore just is seen to be done but uh, there is too close connection so i'm not sure whether the funder situation will continue in eternity given the general developments we have in other areas concerning disclosure and uh, neutrality but Stefan, generally your view is that third party funding should be transparent and disclosed in arbitration beforehand in or my in my view, it should be disclosed who is the funder, not details of the funding agreement, whatever. Yeah. Because as an arbitrator, whatever, you, the last thing you want is have render an award later on to be challenged. Yeah, And we have seen cases where, though the arbitrator was not aware of anything, in the end, the award was set aside due to objectively existing connections. And to avoid that, I'm in favor of disclosing the funder, the name of the funder, not the details of the funding agreement. Thank you very much. This is very helpful. Alice, would you like would you like to comment uh, the act's position on it? Um, I think um, uh, Stefan Riegler has pretty much uh, um, uh, summarized what were the considerations, and I can just disclose that we are currently thinking whether what is now uh, written in the handbook as a commentary, whether in the next edition of the Viag rules we will simply codify, so to say, because it's now considered best practice. Um, back then, when we revised the rules in 2018, the ICA report was not yet out. There were small um, um, provisions in some rules and we really did not want to push forward and put something in the rules that is then later on not considered but rather put it in the guidelines for, for arbitrators but I think now uh, we are probably ready to go forward but also with a limited kind of um, disclosure obligation as has been said it, it's important that the arbitrator knows who is the funder in order to make um, that, that conflict check. Thank you, Alice, and thank you for reminding us and our listeners that uh, there is an ICA report, which is quite recent and very, very substantial piece of research, which I think will be one of the most useful tools and references on the topic for, for the nearest years. Uh, as ICA's uh, member, I can, I can confirm that. Uh, so, Jonathan, uh, we would like to hear from you uh, the insights uh, how do you manage to run litigation, providing the money without crossing crossing the red flags and uh, putting putting further further award at risk? Why is it the balance? Yeah, thank you, and thank you so much for the primers there to really lay the landmines for me to go and step on because it's very easy to to understand this. If I put my lawyer's hat on, 
I, I do understand the caution with which lawyers and 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 arbitrators approach this issue. Um, from a funder's perspective, it's it's very simple. We have an investment. We seek a return on that investment. In order to do so, we need to ensure that nothing can impinge or impugn the enforceability of the award. So the questions of control and conflicts of interest and, and related issues, when viewed through that prism, become crystal clear, namely... Control, well, we do not control the proceedings. We have no interest in telling counsel what to do, what not to do, certainly not the client. So the relationship between a client and uh, counsel is sacrosanct, regardless of jurisdiction, and we respect that. We know that, and it's not in our interests to interfere with that. Part of our agreement to fund a case is that we, through our due diligence, um, agree that counsel on the case are suitable, they have the expertise, we don't tell counsel what to do, we don't interfere with any issues. You raised before the, the concept or, or the, the, the prospect of settlement. Of course, at settlement, there can be divergent views, there can be divergent interests. In our, in our case, we can and often do build into the litigation funding agreement corridors where counsel can make, reject, consider um, offers of settlement without even contacting us, without even informing us of doing so. So we trust counsel to to undertake uh, those discussions in the best interest of their client. Um, Martin, but do you, sorry, do, it's important. Do you prefer to suggest your trusted pool of counsels or you leave it to, you leave it to those who seek, who seek the funding to select the counsels whom they prefer? Yeah, the latter. We don't get involved at all in council selection, expert selection. We do not control to any extent the proceedings. We we receive the funding application. We receive the all, all associated issues, including the strategy, the proposed strategy of council. Now, I can put on my lawyer's hat and question certain aspects of that, um, maybe even offer a suggestion. Consider this. If you don't take the suggestion, that's fine. You don't need to. We consider the case as presented to us. We do not influence or seek to control in any way uh, what counsel's strategy is, what the party is seeking. To us, it's a question of what is presented to us. Is that something we are prepared to invest in? With respect to conflicts of interest, it's, it's an even clearer issue. Given that enforceability is the, is the, the main goal for us and also for the parties at heart, I mean, the interests are aligned. Um, enforceability is key. Conflicts is often you know, a hidden landmine in many ways. So, yes, we have no problem with disclosing the existence um, of that there is a funder if it needs to be the name of the funder. I mean, that can help the, the funded party in many ways. Let's say David versus Goliath, those scenarios. But just in general, in some jurisdictions, Singapore, Hong Kong, it's, this is uh, by regulation, by statute, that the parties or their counsel need to make such disclosure. Uh, here, though, we, we don't take a position. What I would say, though, and this is not through the eyes of uh, a funder, it's through the eyes of counsel, in particular the counterparty. It can be more often than not, and we've seen this with security for cost application, the increase in the number of security for cost applications, both in treaty and commercial cases, uh, which is reported publicly as well. Parties, counterparties, uh, start or take the view, the party is funded, Therefore, let's apply for security for costs, get the money in the bank up front, uh, and away we go. So strategically, there is a, a, a an issue, a question for counsel for the funded party to consider, namely, is it wise? Firstly, is it necessary? In most jurisdictions, it is not necessary. So then the next question is, is it worthwhile, wise, to make the tribunal aware? Um, we don't take, again, we don't take a position either way. What I would say, though, is that it can also, the door swings both ways. Namely, if, for example, an arbitrator has an interest, for example, owns shares in a publicly listed funder, then that arbitrator may seek to disclose that in the interests of absolute caution. You know, I own shares in X, Y, and Z. I don't know if that funder is involved in this arbitration, but for the sake of disclosing, discharging my obligation, there it is. It's on the record. 
so in, in short, our key focus is enforceability and everything falls into line behind that. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, uh, our distinguished speakers. And we move to uh, the questions section. Uh, uh, as our event is approaching its uh, end, and uh, the question which I which I left uh, the question from our from our uh, part, uh, participants today, uh, which I left to the end, is why uh, do Russians so often choose uh, law of England as a law applicable to the contract and choose London as a seat for arbitration? I would express my view, uh, which would be very simple, because of the vast presence of English law firms in Russia. Uh, Russian market is open. We are very open. We are very transparent. There is no burden, no hurdle for opening office of foreign law firms in Russia. And part of the problem why Austrian law uh, is not yet so popular is absence of uh, uh, enough uh, amount of Austrian law firms offices in Moscow, because normally you promote your own domestic law in your own domestic uh, seat of arbitration, sending the work from Moscow to your London offices and your London teams. But I would like to uh, listen to uh, uh, Alice and uh, Paul Stephens' uh, view uh, about this uh, reason and how it can be changed in the view of Brexit and uh, uh, renaissance of continental law firms, uh, which we're currently experiencing, and continental law. Uh, just, just a few comments, two, three points, uh, which you consider the key. Um, um, I will start first because I can I can really say from experience. I often talk to in-house councils um, and and also party representatives, and I ask them in that particular contract why did you put in that law or that um, um, choice of forum or arbitration clause, and they say because it's a it's a sample clause. It has been there for ages, and it's really there's no sophistication usually behind it. It's just because someone a couple of years before has decided the policy for the firm to be this, and then this clause is copy pasted and there's no no reasoning behind so i think uh what i always try to say to people you need to make a conscious decision there might be situation when you have a finance contract but it's probably really the best thing to go to london because they have the experience but for other smaller contracts commercial contracts there is no real reason to to resort to london to their cost structures but you need to change the sample clauses and to make a policy within the company when do I use which kind of dispute resolution mechanisms? And that is that is key. Breaking breaking um, old habits. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I I agree with you. Uh, I have to note, English law is put has been put in many long term running agreements, including the um, including the. Uh, shareholder agreements. However, we should keep in mind that LCIA is not yet registered in Russia, and there is already a case law which is bearing Vostok precedent where uh, enforceability of uh, arbitration clause for LCIA um, pre-2017 in relation to shareholder agreement was not enforced by Russian courts because, just because, the institution is not registered under the new rules of the Russian arbitration law. So VIAC has natural competitive advantage and uh, all infrastructural projects which are now vast in Russia, uh, Arctic Sea Route, are opened for VIAC to teach and explain the benefits uh, of the Austrian law. This is just, just out, of the, out of the head, an observation. Uh, what, what's, what's the view of Stefan uh, Riegel and Stefan Kroll on this? Um, I think um, some of it has been mentioned by Alice. I think in the finance world, for example, there is a certain standard of English law in the uh, courts uh, uh, there. Um, there is uh, some justification for that because there is case law and it has been followed by uh, I guess, so there is certain pre pre predictability. At the same time, um, there is, uh, I think, um, a certain extent of people living in London and shareholder disputes might be linked to that. And there might be reasons to switch to Vienna for these kind of things. It's also a very nice place to be. But 
yes, I do believe that there is a certain chance that the status a couple of years ago might be different in a couple of years for the reasons that have been mentioned. And uh, certainly we do hope that Vienna uh, would be um, a good alternative. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I agree that uh, pitch towards uh, uh, a good place to stay and good place to live is very important, uh, too. Uh, Stefan Kohl, would you like to make any comments uh, before, we, uh, before we move to closing remarks? Any comments on English law versus German law, Austrian law? No, I think everything has been said with one exception, that is language. Yeah? So people are very often afraid that uh, in the end it, it will be German somehow. Yeah? So I think that would also be something where the legislator could help the uh, arbitration community saying, if it's only the Supreme Court, we have judges who are fluent in English, we can continue the proceedings uh, in English in the state courts, or at least present documents in English. And what the Austrians have already done, that they, that everything has to be published. Yeah, So there is a provision there which says uh, if there's considerable interest, uh, these proceedings can be held in um, yeah, in confidential, may kept confidential. Yes, I think that is all. But apart from that, there's old habits die hard. That's the problem. Uh, Ilona, thank you, thank you, Stefan. Ilona, as a head of our European desk, what what would you think would be the um, benefits and uh, competitive advantages uh, to pitch uh, for Austrian law instead of English law and uh, English arbitration in current times and current environment? I mean, I said, I think I've said everything. What has to be said already? why to choose Austria. I mean, first of all, I have to say as well, I mean, I don't know what's going on with London in the future. We have seen as well a lot of Russians moving back from London to to, um, to Russia, but still I haven't seen so many Russians moving back from Austria back to Russia. And I think as well, it's very important the job Alice is doing by constantly coming to, to Moscow and to the CIS region and as well to the St. Petersburg Forum to promote VIAC, Vienna Rules, and Vienna as a place of arbitration. And as Evgeny, as you have mentioned before, unfortunately, there are no Austrian law firms in Moscow. I mean, other than the other CE countries where Austria as a place of arbitration is as well promoted by the law firms. But don't forget, you have me as an Austrian lawyer, qualified lawyer, in Moscow, and I think together with Alice and the VIAC, and as well with our friends from the Austrian law firms being based in Vienna, but having significant uh, experience on the CIS market, like Stefan Riegler from Wolfteist and others, I think that's a good opportunity for us to promote Austria as a place for arbitration and as well to convince uh, Russian companies and Russian clients or CIS clients in general uh, to. to add and, and establish more ties to the VIAC and to consider Austria as a place for arbitration. I mean, as I said before, I'm doing this the last 13 years since I have left Vienna and I have seen um, that uh, some success already. So I have to say, luckily, all these contracts I have closed with Vienna arbitration, uh, seat, uh, uh, seat Vienna as an arbitration place. Um, have so far not turned in, into any arbitration. So maybe the contracts are too good. But I hope that we will see in future more Russian and CIS cases in Vienna. And uh, if any questions, I think Alice, uh, Stefan and I will also be available after the webinar to, to answer questions our participants uh, and attendees who uh, have been to today with us at the webinar. Thank you, Ilona. And uh, 30 seconds to Jonathan. Uh, if you have Austrian law instead of English law, so if you have two cases, one is under Austrian law and the other one under English law, uh, with different places of arbitration, uh, equal risks otherwise, what would, you, what would you select, actually? And you have only one sum to bet on, you know, you, you cannot split it. What, what, what would be your choice? <laughs> I, I don't think it's a choice, is it? <laughs> it really doesn't matter. For... <laughs> it, it has to be Austrian law. I mean, as an English lawyer, I'm just going to say Austrian law. Yes, Austrian law all the way. If from our perspective, it doesn't matter. 
It, it, it really doesn't. I mean, we do our due diligence, uh, and if the case has prospects of success, great. Each legal system, of course, has its ins and outs. Um, you know, just at a, at a very broad, from a very broad approach, you have he, here in, in Austria, from a funder's perspective, the attraction is, firstly, you know, one-stop shop straight to the Supreme Court uh, with awards. So that's a fantastic cost-saving mechanism. From our perspective, in England, you've got three levels of appeal. So that's time and cost. Um, so the governing law aspect, you know, yes, you have English law, commercial law, which is well developed, etc. Also here in Austria, um, in terms of governing law, it's not really something that's so determinative from our perspective. It's more the, the economics of the case together with, you know, prospects of success. Does the investment make sense? Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you all our distinguished speakers. It was a pleasure moderating you today. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you, Alice, for uh, joining us on this uh, wonderful event, uh, which I hope would become regular because we do need to hear from our Austrian colleagues. Uh, and all the best. And as Alona said, if you have any further questions, please address them uh, privately or write to our speakers. Uh, I'm sure they will be they will be answered and commented. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.